So I've been told that we're running really short on time, and so I'm just going to cut to the chase. I mean, congratulations, you got in. So come. <laughs> All right. Um, I want us to start today with an act of imagination. Oops. I want you to imagine an interconnected world. This is a world in which you can travel across countries fairly easily. In fact, you can travel across of Europe, uh, most of Europe without even having a passport. This is a world in which uh, new technologies are making it possible for information to travel across the world as never before. Tokyo, Paris, New York, Buenos Aires, connected like that. This is a world in which uh, there's great kinds of opportunities coming up in areas of, again, technology and information exchange, enormous amounts of migration around the world. It's also a time, though, in which the leading power of the world is starting to feel itself teetering a little bit. It's starting to feel that other kinds of powers are coming up, and it's worried that it might be losing its place. And this is a world, too, in which globalization losers are feeling like their jobs are getting squeezed in a, an era of enormous free trade, for example. They're feeling like inequality is rising. They're feeling like political systems are really unresponsive. And the conditions are totally ripe for the rise of populists and demagogues. If this world sounds to you a lot like the world today, you're wrong. Well, you're right, but it also sounds like the world of another time, and that is the world around 1900, about 100 years ago, when all of the things that I just described were already in evidence. Now, the process of what we call globalization, the interconnection of markets, of peoples, of ideas, this is a process that is as old as human history itself. And for me, as a historian, this is the thing that I really think is the central story of history. The central story for me is how do people and ideas, goods, how do all these things move across borders? It's a story that we can trace back 250,000 years ago. We can trace it actually using sources that are written in our own bodies in our DNA. And we can trace the movement of humanity from continent to continent from 250,000 years ago. And now and then, in history, there are sort of step changes in the scale and the range of this kind of intercontinental connection. 4,000 years ago, ancient trade networks. 600 years ago, 500 years ago, the Columbian Exchange, transatlantic. Until we get to this world around 1900, a world in which we can see a sort of boom going up in the level, the range, the scale of interconnection, a boom that peaks around 1913, right at the eve of World War I, and that will not be matched again until the latest version picking up in the 1980s, when all of these kinds of processes of interconnection begin to take off again. Now, social scientists tend to study globalization with devices like this, as something that you can chart and something that you can graph, looking at economics, for example, among other things. As a historian, what I'm really interested in, though, is what all of this means for you and for me. What does this mean for ordinary people's lives? What does this mean for the people who are caught up in it? To get a sense of that, let me introduce you to a 17-year-old young man. His name is Yusuf Theodor Konrad Korzhenyovsky. He was 17 in the early 1870s. He had been born in 1857 in an area of present-day Ukraine, which at the time was part of the Russian Empire. Konrad Korzhenyovsky was uh, uh, raised to parents who were really avid Polish nationalists. This was a time at which there was no state of Poland, and as an ethnic Pole raised in this area of the Russian Empire, he was an ethnic minority. His parents fought to try to get a Polish state established in Eastern Europe, and for their pains, for their effort, for their struggle, they were persecuted and indeed prosecuted by the Russian authorities. His father was uh, imprisoned, and both of his parents, along with him, were sent into exile in different, rather inhospitable parts 
of the Russian Empire. They did not have Dr. Counter's uh, technology, nor did they have his appetite for raw uh, polar bear and the other kinds of things that you find in inhospitable parts of the North. Uh, but uh, they, uh, instead, they moved from place to place to place. And uh, this young man, Korzeniowski, was raised against the backdrop of uh, uh, sort of real political uh, uh, tribulations and also uh, watched his parents really suffer from the kind of uh, experience they had. They, they both contracted tuberculosis. Uh, at first, his mother died when he was eight years old, and by the time he was 11, he was an orphan. And I think it may have been because of this childhood on the move from place to place, a childhood as really a displaced person, a stateless person, and a migrant, that by the time he was 17, Yusuf Korzeniowski had developed a fantasy about what he wanted to do with himself, and it wasn't a fantasy that involved going to Harvard. It was a fantasy that instead involved becoming a sailor and going to sea. After all, he had been adrift his entire life. And this picture is taken of him right at the time that he's about to set off on his great journey to go to Marseille in France, where he is going to start to learn to be a sailor. He's been raised speaking French, he goes off to Marseille, starts to be a sailor, and for the next 20 years, Korzeniowski will pursue a career as a sailor. Mostly on British ships, as it happens. You see him here having grown a beard, a hipster, avant la lettre. Uh, and uh, he will travel uh, around the world, mostly on British ships, going to Asia, going to Australia, even going to Africa. Now, why is this story of Korzeniowski interesting from the point of view of getting a sense of globalization from within. Well, there are a number of things about his life that I think uh, can tell us something about conditions that we live in now. One is he is stateless and he is an immigrant. And he's eventually going to find a home for himself in one of the great capitals of, uh, of cosmopolitan Europe and indeed the cosmopolitan world, and that is the city of London, which to this day is one of the most international places in the world. He's also a guy who is working in one of the industries as a sailor that is most responsible for knitting together the world with all of those lines and connections and transporting bigger numbers of migrants around the world than has ever before been the case. And as a sailor, he is seeing these parts of the world, and he's also engaged in an industry which is in this period undergoing an enormous amount of technological change. Something else very significant from this world of about 100 years ago is that the world of sort of wind power and so on, sailing ships, is giving way to the diesel-powered, fossil fuel-powered era that we still live with now. Sailing ships are being displaced by steamships, and the world of work that he's in is really changing. Finally, he does see the world, right? He goes out to Asia, Africa, etc. He sees the places that are being knitted together through these networks of shipping and communications and capitalism, among other things. And he also sees, and this is important, he also sees the places and the people that in some ways are left out by these systems, by traveling out beyond the range, as he will put it, beyond the range of the telegraph wires, beyond the range of some of the steamship lines. So there are a lot of reasons this fellow, Korzeniowski, is of interest to me as an illustration of globalization. But it's what he does next when he leaves the sea that makes me most intrigued by his story. Because Józef Teodor Konrad Korzeniowski, born in Ukraine, speaking Polish, moving to France to become a sailor, finds a home in London. And when he retires from the sea in his 30s, he takes up a new career. And that career is to be a novelist, a full-time writer in English, his third language, a language that he learned only in his early 20s. And he ends up taking on an English name, Joseph Conrad. And under that name, Joseph Conrad, he becomes responsible for producing one of the most influential bodies of literature for his era. Now put your hand up if you have read a work by Joseph Conrad. I am very heartened to see this. And let me make a proposal for your next kind of 24 hours of Visitas. Instead of asking people, where are you from? Where'd you go to high school? Where else are you considering? What's your favorite Conrad novel? It's a great conversation starter, I have to tell you. 
So in these works that Conrad wrote, it's really an over, of extraordinary geographical and topical range. He writes novels that are set in Europe, he writes novels set in Asia, set in, uh, in, in South America, and set uh, most famously for most of you today in Africa when he fictionalizes that journey that he took uh, in Africa as a sailor to create his enduring novella, Heart of Darkness. And in these books of Conrad's, He's really focused on characters who are navigating the realm of globalization, who are navigating the forces of multinational capitalism and nationalism and imperialism and migration and technological change. And in his fiction, these are forces that are both opening up possibilities for people in the way they had opened up possibilities for him, but they also come with risks and they come with costs and they come with constraints. And he's interested in his fiction, also in writing about the people who don't have a state. The sailors who can't find work in steam when technology changes their industry. He's interested in the backwaters, quite literally, where progress has not entirely made it. And he's also interested in the places where progress is actually a cover for imperialism and expropriation, as it is in Heart of Darkness. Conrad places special attention, I think, on these moments when ordinary people are making critical choices about how to act and also how to react to forces that are bigger than themselves. So what's the moral of Conrad's story as a lesson in globalization? Well, I could tell you that life is a process of discovery and self-invention. I could urge you to see the world I could urge you to, uh, to, to be creative in your pursuits. I could urge you to find and follow your passion. And I could urge you, of course, not to screw up the choice that you have in front of you right now, which is, of course, the choice that you need to come to Harvard. But I want to leave you instead with another thought. And this other thought is about imagination. You know, you don't even have to imagine an interconnected world. In this room right now, there is gathered an incredible cross-section of the ethnicities, the socioeconomic backgrounds, the nationalities, and of course the talents of this world, in this room right now. And if you come to Harvard, you will be encouraged to leverage those connections in order to make your own experience of the world that much richer, that much deeper, and that much more wide-ranging. So you don't have to imagine the interconnected world. You are in it, and you are of it, and you are making it right now. I want to encourage you instead, and in addition, to imagine your way out of that world. Don't forget the other things that are out there. I want you to imagine what else and what if. I want you to imagine who else and what then. I want you to imagine that the choices that you are making now are choices that are going to shape those futures. And I want you to remember that the difference between what you know and what you imagine, the space between what you know and what you imagine, is the space where the really good stuff is going to happen and also the really important things too. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thanks very much.